Welcome to the November 22nd, 2022 Education and Pupil Services Committee in-person and virtual meeting. The meeting of the Education and Pupil Services Committee will please come to order. The district posted this evening's agenda to board docs at least 24 hours prior to the commencement of this meeting. Is there a motion to approve that previously posted agenda? So moved. Second. Thank you. Are there any amendments to offer? There are not. Thank you. The agenda has been moved and seconded. All, the, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying aye opposed and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying aye abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carried. I will now turn over the Education and Pupil Services Committee agenda to co-chair Director Williams. Uh, Mr. Marshallick and uh, Dr. Kelly, I will now turn this over to you. You can begin with an overview of agenda items for this evening, and then you may just go right into the meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so tonight we have two agenda items. Uh, one is information and one is for board action. The first one is a special education plan. It's informational. It's an overview. Uh, it's hard to believe we're back at our planning process again for our three-year uh, special education plan. So we'll go through the timeline and how we're going to complete that for the school year. It's due May 1st of 2023. The second item is uh, for board action. It's the adoption of plan instruction for a new course here at Upper Darby High School for emergency personnel. Uh, Dr. Kelly, uh, Ms. Simone, and our, we're grateful to have a special guest, uh, Fire Chief Sawyer, here t uh, tonight to go through a proposed uh, course sequence here at the high school um, for EMT and, uh, and, and fire uh, certification. Um, so we'll start quickly going through just a real brief update with the Upper Darby Special Education Plan. Um, hard to believe, you know, towards the start of the pandemic, we com completed this, this plan within the planning process. That was May of 2020, or I'm sorry, March of 2020. Um, we're back at it again. We did submit the plan on time, uh, even though we got an extension, so we kind of, you know, we're, we're back up here at three-year three -year mark. Um, but again, similar process we did in the past, um, we're going to go through um, the timeline, but just to give you general backgrounds from the Department of Education, different from the comprehensive plan, the special education plan describes the special education operations and the planning and the programming we have in the district, uh, caseload requirements, um, how we program for incarcerated students, things of, 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 of that nature. Um, there's no specific goals we would monitor or, or, or numbers we put into place, but we do utilize our cyclical monitoring uh, goals to implement those and to watch those and to implement that plan through the special education plan. But again, this is a general overview of what the plan entails. Um, very similar to the former planning process, even though now we're using the new um, planning tool in the future ready system where before it was not, it was the old you know, kind of clunkier tool. So it's been a new process for us to go through this, but you know, we've experienced with the uh, comprehensive plan as well. Uh, the next slide is uh, kind of going through the overview. So we're gonna start um, well, first, I'm going to kind of give credit to our special education supervisor team who, is, who are here tonight, you know, Mr. Fitty, um, Ms. Jones, Mr. Nielsen, um, Ms. McCoach couldn't be here tonight. She's got a sick sick baby at home, uh, and Ms. Hardis. You think these guys don't get the credit they deserve, really, because of, you know, they're, they're the grinders behind the scenes that don't get to do all the fun stuff, and, and, um, but they do do a whole heck of a lot of work for the district, and they, they deserve a lot of credit for putting these plans in place. So they're leading the majority of the planning teams. Um, for the special education plan with the parents and other stakeholders uh, taking chunks of the plan developing it over the course of this school year. Um, but initially the first phase is to look at between now and December is identify our stakeholder groups. Um, we're looking for teachers, special and general education teachers, uh, related arts teachers, specialists, psychologists, speech and language pathologists. Um, hint, hint, Ms. Ganges, if you're over there, if you want to be, be a member of the team. Um, we also need uh, parents. Um, so you'll see later in the presentation how you can uh, uh, not apply, but provide interest you know, to, to my office if you want to be a member of the planning team. Uh, the parents are a key part of this, uh, this process, special education parents and also general education parents. Um, we'll identify our team uh, by early December, and then we'll start planning out our bi-monthly team meetings uh, late December, right, right after winter break, um, or before winter break, and then early January. Last time we did this, we started them later in January. We did get it completed by the time you know, we had the shutdown in March. Um, so we feel like this is still a good timeline to follow. Um, look at our public review, again, similar to what we did in the previous planning process uh, cycle, uh, March, the March committee meeting of 2023. That'll start our 28-day review, which is a requirement. Um, and then we'll ideally have another presentation at the April committee meeting 
um, and then for uh, admission or submission and affirmation by May 1st of 2023 uh, to the Department of Education. Uh, but again, very similar timeline of process we, we did in the past. And again, tonight we're asking for any parents, teachers, specialists, anyone who's out there who's watching, and we'll push this out as well in a, in a parent link. If you are interested in being a member of the planning team, you can submit your interest uh, to the uh, email address you see on the screen here. We'll monitor that and we'll collect it and then we'll you know, put a hard cutoff date you know, probably right before um, winter break. Uh, but I'll put that out in an email to the, to the community. Again, so they kind of the information in writing in an email. And then uh, we'll take the next steps from that, that point forward. But again, that's it for this evening for this. Just a brief overview and update on the planning process. And again, it's informational tonight as our agenda item. So next, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Kelly Simone, who's going to uh, start the uh, presentation this evening for Emergency Personnel Pre Preparation Course Proposal. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. And good evening, everyone. The idea of an emergency preparation course evolved from a conversation I participated in uh, with our superintendent of schools, Dr. McGarry, the Upper Darby Fire Chief Sawyer, and Upper Darby High School Principal, Dr. Alloway. We were really excited at the opportunity to partner with the Upper Darby Fire Department and create a course at the high school that provides a career pathway as an emergency medical technician and firefighter. In addition, Dr. Christine Kelly, our Director of Curriculum, and Ms. Beth Riches, one of our district supervisors, have been working on course details and curriculum implications. We are pleased to be here this evening to share our final proposal for consideration and are thankful that Chief Sawyer could join us tonight. Not only does the course build community partnership, but it also satisfies the state graduation requirement known as Act 158. The instructional program prepares individuals to apply the technical knowledge and skills required to perform entry-level duties as a firefighter, um, paramedic, and other safety services. The four-year course sequence will run consecutively through a student's sophomore and junior year with one course meeting each semester. The following slide describes <clears throat> the course breakdown and the units covered per year. Course one and two would be covered in a student's 10th grade academic year as electives in semester one and semester two. And course three and four would be covered in a student's 11th grade academic year as electives in again semester one and semester two. And at this time I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Sawyer uh, to elaborate on the units of study. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> so the course, the way it's laid out in the units of study the goal is to have the students graduate with at least two certifications, one as a firefighter and one as an emergency medical technician. And what that does is it gives them two career paths to follow. Um, not only that, it creates a pipeline for the Upper Darby Township Fire Department so that we don't have to go out recruiting members of the fire service and it gives those seniors an opportunity to have employment right at the school if they choose not to go directly to college. And even if they go to college, because of our schedule, they could actually go to college and work at the same time. So we believe that it's, a, it's a not only a, a good way to recruit members within the community, but also a pipeline to employment for the township and tax revenue. Um, if these uh, proposed courses um, are adopted, my office would start to process um, policy 108 for the adoption of textbooks. We will need to um, consider two different textbooks um, to support both ends of this curriculum, one for firefighting and also for the EMT piece of it. Um, as we started to look at the cost of textbooks, they range anywhere from 40 to 40 to $60 um, a piece, and they would be classroom sets that the students could use throughout their career path or throughout this pathway of these four series of electives. Um, we would, so um, we estimated the cost at about $16,000, which was on the high side. We would go through the regular budget process. So when I meet with Craig, when Dr. Alloway meets with Craig, um, and we start to talk about elective costs and things like that, we would consider this as one of our new purchases that we would need. We would also look at any other additional costs, such as instructional materials. Um, with that, we are looking at um, teacher materials. We're looking at any additional costs that sometimes the e-books bring about and things like that but also looking at consumable textbooks, 
or consumable workbooks in this area, which seems to be a, a big piece of this, um, as well as any um, curriculum mapping costs that would have to um, play a part of the instructional materials or the instruction, additional instructional costs that would be there. Um, we will also have to look at um, the personnel piece of this. Uh, we currently, when we are talking about core selectives, we would look at how many students would be selecting this, and one of our health and PE teachers would be working um, alongside of one of Chief Sawyer's um, instructors to really look at a co-taught model for this um, in, uh, as an elective course that we would be offering our students. So if this course is... Um, is approved, it would be approved at our next uh, board meeting, which would be in December, and this would be our timeline. And then in January, um, we would add it to the course selection guide and the course uh, uh, process, or the course selection process. At the same time as we're um, getting board approval and adding it to the course uh, selection guide, we would also have to look for the student interest um, at, this at that point and make a textbook recommendation at that committee meeting in January. After that, um, it would be formally approved um, as a course offering, and students could select it in February as they're going through the process of uh, choosing their courses for the 23-24 school year. And then we would be able to implement the course actually in the 23-24 school year, course one and two right now as incoming uh, sophomores for that class. So at this point, we thank you, um, and we will um, ask for any questions from the board. I just had a, a, a brief question or suggestion for the first presentation, especially one. I know there's an email address that you, that's included in the presentation. Can that be added to, uh, you know, maybe some information on our website so that if you're looking for parents to engage, they may not go to board docs and have to go through that to find the email address, but if we can put it on our website, people might know that we're looking for people to be a part of that group. So. Yep, certainly will. Okay. Thank you. Well done. Good presentations. Thanks. For the second presentation, are, are there anticipation of, um, of a possible course that would see lower enrollment because of these courses if we were to offer, and like what course would that be? Because um, obviously some other course would have to see lower enrollment if this one is implemented. Uh, sure. So with any of our course selection, it, we always run courses based on student interest and staff. So we would use our course selection process um, and based on the request and the available staff, they're the courses that run no matter what the course is. So it does vary per year. Okay, thank you. And, the, and on the first presentation um, for the special education plan, uh, could I just get some clarification? Is this just how the district operates or is there any sort of um, goal set up? Like for instance, uh, if we have a, a case load number, this is what it was the actual number for the past, like let's say five years each year, um, but we're working to commit ourselves to a certain number. Is, is there a goal setting in this? Because it's, it says like an action plan, like you know specific actions. Could you uh, discuss that? Right, so the, the, there are case load requirements in the plan, so there's, there's part of it, it's called the separate. Um, and you're probably familiar with this too, from, from your experience as a teacher, but every teacher gets assigned their caseload at the time of the plan creation, and it's listed in this plan. And then every summer, what we do is when caseloads get, you know, change or teachers change over, we update the caseload requirement in the, in the separate every year and get that, and get that you know, re-approved re, re, re um, with Department of Ed. The goal section, it's, as I was trying to explain, it's a little bit different than the comprehensive plan goals where you set, like, targets over three years. The goals they just, that you would identify in uh, the special ed plan are tied to your uh, monitoring. So we went through uh, monitoring two years ago. Um, did pretty well with our monitoring. We had a couple areas for LRE, for example. We didn't hit the threshold for the state level for having as many kids in 80% um, or more in general ed. So we put a plan in place to then identify how to increase more students in general ed for 80% more of the day. That'll be a goal in the plan that we'll talk about. We've already established that as part of our cyclical monitoring already but will be referenced in this plan but there's no new goal creation like like what we're talking about there's not a new goal we would make up to put in there to try to work on okay thank you uh, can we go to the units of study slide thanks um uh, i think this is awesome all right so my uh, older two sons took the ent course at the community college it's about a six week i want to say a six week program it might be longer it was been a few years I think at the time it was about sixteen hundred dollars, and and so, yeah, yeah. I I, I remember. 
because I wrote the check. So, um, and uh, so this this right off the bat, this is great. This is great. Uh, I do, and it's not a, a it's not a deal breaker. I, th I think it's still an awesome opportunity. I do remember uh, the an instructor at the college told my boys that completing that got them the third of the way to a paramedics associates. So I don't know if any of that's been discussed, but it, it would be great if if the kids could come out of this program not only being an EMT and having the fire uh, the firefighter training that we talked about, but also if it's possible if the community college could look at that and say, oh, well, you're a third of the way there. It, it may not be something you looked at. It's still a great program, but that would be like, that's the cherry right on top. So that, that would be great. Um, and uh, I know uh, Chief Sawyer has a vested interest in this program. Uh, it, but, but, you know, it's not just Upper Darby. I mean, these are skills that are in demand uh, everywhere. Um, my son that works in a seasonal trade, this is the work he does off season. He drives an ambulance and he helps people get people to dialysis and stuff like that. That's that kind of work. It's, this kind of work, it's not what you see on TV. It's all sorts of type, all sorts of levels of work from just getting somebody to the doctor's, well, not doctor's point, but a dialysis point is a great example. To, yeah, depending on the skill set, going to, you know, em emergencies and stuff like that. And, and, and a lot of things in medicine are, what does somebody enjoy, right? Because not everybody likes going to the emergencies. They like taking people to their doctor's appointments, right? And, and they're good. And some people, they like the emergencies. And they can find that. And that's what's really awesome about this, right? And um, I'm excited for it. I'm really glad we, we're bringing it in. Great insight. But I, but I definitely want to see about that, that community college piece. Just if it's a Yeah, I think that um, the EMT is the first step. If you remember, I talked about two career paths. And once the person likes be at the medical piece, they could become a paramedic. They could become a nurse practitioner. So there's a lot of room for growth there. So um, I think the next move is to try to partner with the college to say once they finish our program, can they just transition into the community college program? So we're working, we're willing to work with anybody that's willing to partner with us for the progression of our students. Um, I have a question about minimum age. So they would be coming out in their junior year finishing course four, and if they're 17, would they be able to apply for employment as a firefighter? They would not. They would have to be 18 years of age, um, but that was, it used to be 21 years of age, and I was able to get it reduced to 18. So, no, but the key is uh, there's an internship piece in this where they could start volunteering for the fire department, and then when they turn 18, they would already be a member of the department, and they could become full-time career members and staff. Okay. So they, they can't. Uh, fortunately, that legislation has just passed where they can at least, at least get all their certification done, their burns done at the age of 17. Awesome. Thank you. I just want to say, I, I don't remember how many months ago it was when you came to me about this, um, and I told you this is the timeline, and, we, and we'd hit it. So to Kelly and... Uh, and Christine, thank you to the supervisors. But Chief Sawyer, I just want to say thank you to the partnership. It's refreshing, you know, having you involved here in the community, reaching out to you back and forth. You've, it's never been a no. It's always a yes. You always pick up the phone. I appreciate that relationship that we have. And I think it'd be great to see our kids, Upper Darby School District kids, working with you and working in the community that way. Um, so it's great. So I just want to say thank you to reaching out, having the courage to reach out and, and reach out to us to make this happen. And the next steps, you know, it's, it's my, an education, it's miles to go before you get there, but these are some really good first steps, and I appreciate your courage to, to reach out and to partner with us, so thank you. I'd like to say thank you also, because again, you didn't say no, and um, I think this is huge, but not every school district is willing to take on that work to get it done so that we can give this to our children, so thank you also. Okay, we are now at the time for public comments on this, um, these two agenda items. Are there any comments from the public on these two agenda items that we have? 
Hi, my name is Michelle Schofield, and I live on uh, 519 Millbank Road. I stayed for this part of the meeting because I'm really excited about this uh, the CT program being introduced to the school district, and I'm really hoping that it is accepted and approved by the board because this is really exciting, especially because there was just a comment at um, our council meeting saying that there was like a shortage in fire staff and the junior fire department, so this was right on time. Well done, Chief Sawyer. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on this? Uh, these two agenda items? There are no virtual comments at this time. Thank you. Hearing none, we can uh, have a review of the agenda items for this evening. Okay, so again, tonight there were two agenda items. First was information only, the special education plan. And um, the second one is uh, board action, the adoption of plan instruction, the emergency personnel preparation, uh, courses one through four. Thank you so much for your presentation tonight, and thank you, Chief Sawyer, for being here tonight. Um, and the board needs to vote in December, but do we just need to move that forward for um, a vote? Does the board want to move that forward for a December vote? Yes. Absolutely. Yes, Definitely. yes, yes. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back over to President Brown. Thank you, Director Williams. Thank you for facilitating the meeting. A motion is in order for the adjournment of the Education and Pupil Services Committee meeting. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, meeting adjourned.